So hello, Guy. I'm so happy to have you. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, would you mind just introducing yourself briefly before we... Sure. Up? My name is Guy Wallace. I've been in the instructional systems design business since 1979. I've been a consultant since 1982. I work with a lot of uh, Fortune 500 companies, uh, larger companies and technical and, uh, well, all sorts of functions across the enterprise. But uh, I, I, I've got a lot of experience doing uh, instructional design work and things that go beyond instruction to help uh, improve performance on the job. Yeah, and you also have like a great website with loads of information and a couple of great books as well. So we'll post uh, some links uh, to your work uh, as well for the for the participants to uh, to visit later. So we are uh, well. So at least what I would like to talk about is um, how you work with subject matter experts to create work examples. So yeah, how how do you go about that? Like, what's your approach? Well, uh, I, I like to start with working with groups or teams of people, people that I call master performers and other subject matter experts. Sometimes you need somebody from regulatory affairs involved because the master performers may or may not be exactly in alignment with what the new regulations are or what the current regulations are. So, But I like to work with teams of people because I've seen uh, throughout the years, I started doing this in 1979, working with teams of people that the thinking, the out loud thinking of one person stimulates the thinking of everybody else, and they all be able, be able to contribute to what it is we're producing. So, uh, so when I do work examples, to me, the work example is the final output. It's the thing that's produced. And then there's a method or a process, a set of tasks to produce that output. So when I work with teams of master performers and other folks, I always try to begin with the end in mind. What's that output that you're producing? And sometimes they can think of that. They think that along those lines and sometimes they don't. They have to think about the tasks that they perform and then, aha, the output becomes apparent to them. So can you give an example of an output? Like what does that mean? Yeah. So if you're uh, doing financial analyses, you might have to produce a, an income statement or a balance sheet. Okay, so in, in the context of a job, it can be like a deliverable. Some, yeah, something it's a, it is produce. a deliverable. As I used to say it's a physical kickable deliverable, but if it's the decision, you can write the decision down to make it physical and kickable. So it's got to be something that's tangible. When I, I was first taught this, it was that what's left on the desks of people when they're done and they've gone home. So that was one way to think about it as something that's, uh, you know, something that you it can be examined and looked at and assessed for its quality uh, effectiveness, et cetera. Okay, so you start you you start to try with that. You were saying, right? And yeah. And you were also saying that sometimes they're not capable of. They don't really know what well, that's that is, been or my, they don't understand what it means. Yeah, it, it's hard. People think about the things that they do. They don't necessarily always think about the things that they produce. So when I've trained instructional analysis in my methodologies, I say I try to start with the output and what the key measures are, and how do you know a good output from a bad one? But sometimes the, you get a blank stare from the team of mass performers you brought in the room and they're not thinking about that. They can tell you what they do. So then I start asking them about what are the tasks that you perform in the, what we're looking at, whatever the scope of the assignment is. And they'll articulate the tasks and then we may trip across, there's the output because they say, well, then we produce an income statement. I go, aha, that's one of the outputs. And they go, oh, that's what you mean. <laughs> and then they usually can relate to the things that they produce. But, you know, the language that we use in instructional system design doesn't always resonate with our yeah. the people that we're working with. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so then you have like the output, so like the deliverable or the, whatever they produce. Mm -hmm. And then, and then what? Well then, so then I once I you know begin with the end in mind, and then it's the means to that end. So what are the tasks that are performed? Now in our instructional systems design business or learning experience design business, uh, there's a lot of confusion about what comes first: our tasks at the top, and then there's a bunch of steps underneath that or subtasks. So our language is all messy, but I use the term tasks and subtasks or steps, depending on what my client prefers. But so then I'm trying to figure out: so what are the tasks? that are performed to produce that output that meets the stakeholder requirements. And there's two types of tasks in my simple-minded view uh, of all of this. There's the quite 
overt behavioral tasks that we can see and count. Okay. And so I try to get that. So what is it? What's the obvious task that you're doing? But along with those tasks in the workflow, there's the covert cognitive tasks, the thinking that people have to do while they're performing those behavioral tasks. But I usually defer going after the thought flow, the, the cognitive thinking, uh, after I get all the behavioral tasks down, I don't try to mix them up. I just wanna know, so what are the things that you do? And people can usually articulate that. On a subsequent pass at all that data, you know, guys playing dumb and saying, now let me make sure I understand this. So task one is to do this and task two is to do this. So then I start asking them about what thought processes go into that. Are there certain uh, discriminations you need to make? Do you have to be situationally aware when you're doing this task? There could be variables in the performance context that will cause you to use maybe a non-standard task set to produce that output. You see barriers. Okay, well, hold on, one. let's take one step back just for, okay. for our for our like you know listeners. So there's this output, and then the next step you take is you know you have this group of um, master, master performers. performers and and maybe some other types of subject matter experts, and they together debate what it takes to get to that output or or deliverable. Right. So those are what you call the behavioral tasks. Steps, tasks. Yeah. <laughs> So that's like, this is what you do. I do this first and then I do this next and they all debate a little bit. And then yeah. at some point, everybody agrees. Yeah, this is more or less what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And then you move on to what you call the thought flow, which is more about the thinking or the rationale behind those steps. Is that correct? Yes, because sometimes it's not as clear as, you know, ABC, one, two, three. Sometimes you have to vary how you do things yeah. And this is usually comes out when the master performers are talking about the tasks. And that's your first clue that, ah, there's more than one way to get this done. And it's situationally dependent on what is what are the variables or barriers to performance or opportunities to performance. You know, you may be able to take a shortcut because you see something or you may have to go the long route because you see other things. You need to avoid those things. Master performers have figured all of this out. And it's part of their non-conscious knowledge. And yeah. you're, you're trying to elicit that through your approach to understanding the thinking behind the obvious doing. So the behavioral tasks are the things that I say that we can see and we can count them. It's the thinking that, you know, we have to elicit that so that we can share that with our learners so that they know how to think about things as they do them. And they might change what they do, how they do them, uh, depending on what's what has come to their you know their conscious knowledge about the the performance context and what's going on in that. And do you, in your experience, does it in that uh, context also help that you have various people in the room? Because I can imagine that it's not so easy for master performers to explain their rationale because it's also tacit for them, right, and automated yeah. often. Yes. So when I so I'm asking them in a group forum to tell me things so I can write it down on a flip chart easel generally when I'm doing this in a face to face context. And so you get somebody who can think of something and they can tell you and that stimulates the thinking of other people right. because I've made a list of tasks and somebody will say as we're on task number nine, they're going to they say, hold on, everybody back up there between tasks two and three we're missing three tasks. It's this, it's this, it's this. And somebody goes, oh, you're right. How did we forget that? And so I go to the chart and I've learned never to number tasks just to bullet point them because okay. otherwise the numbering becomes a mess. But uh, so I squeeze those things in on the flip chart easel and the flip charts get very messy. But uh, but that stimulates the thinking of other people. So when they, they think out loud about yeah. the tasks, that stimulates everybody else's thinking. And I, I find that I get a very rich a, a set of data, task data. I get additional, you know, f f things about the output, like key measures of the output. You know, there may be the formal corporate measures of how this output is measured, but they know how it's really measured in the real world by all the stakeholders, the downstream customers, the regulators, the management, the, you know, whoever. And so that always kinds of flows out. So I get this very rich set of information about the performance, the output, the measures of that output, the tasks that have to be performed, 
and various ways of thinking about the task. Thinking, about, yeah, and the considerations that they make as they go and the things they look for and their decision making points yeah, and all that. It's all stuff. quite tacit, as you said. And so then you have, because now it sounds to me like you almost have your worked example for the learner ready to go. Well, yes. it might be a bit, but you know, like you have everything that can input into that. Yeah, so you have more than you can, you know, it, you have enough to choke a horse, which is the uh, joke. Maybe that's inappropriate, but uh, but you can't confront the learner with that rich data. You no. have to kind of ease them into it. So you might show a simple output and talk about the tasks at a very high level. So when I take that kind of analysis data into design and into development, especially in development, I'm trying to really understand all the thinking, all the detailed thing. But when I design and then develop content, I usually do it with information, then a demonstration, then an application exercise. So practice with feedback. And when you, you usually you have, if it's something that's very complex, you're going to take a couple of passes at this. You're going to do something that's what I call easy peasy. Here's a simple case. Here's simple information about that. This is what it looks like. These are the simple tasks. Let me demonstrate that to you or show you a video that demonstrates it. Now you go do it. And then we add, start adding complexity into it and we might take it into some level of difficulty where we give a little bit more information about the context that's a little bit trickier. Here's a demonstration of how you would handle that. Now you practice that. And then I go- So into when we think about the, the, the work example, uh context right so that's that would need to be for the let's say initially the simplest form of that output or the tasks that lead to a certain output or the steps um but for you in your uh, approach is is the work example part of the information the demonstration or both Yes. It's so if I were to say, say if the output was a, a financial statement, an income statement, where it's just revenues and costs, and then you got profit before taxes. So I might have shown that in the information stage, this is aha, the end point, you're going to learn how to produce one of these. And here's the simple tasks for doing that. And then you demonstrate it and have them practice. But you could show more complicated income statements with a lot of different sources of revenue and other expenses. And if this is a forecast and not an actual look at the past, here's our income. But, but if we're forecasting this, then you have to make a lot of, bunch of educated guesses as to what where are the revenues coming from? You know, are we working in different geographies and we're going to have different things? And so, you know, we're going to discount prices on, for some customers and not for others. And so it becomes much more complicated to just forecast revenues, and then you can look at all of your various expenses. So if the real world is quite complex and an income statement is three or four or five pages long, you might start with a simple one that's one page yeah. and fairly simple, and you show them the worked example, and you might even do what I call building graphics, uh, where you add, you know, here's, let's look at an income statement. Here's the revenues. Okay. Now we're going to add in on the next slide. Here's where we're going to add so in. So you build the complexity. Yeah. Um, and we could show them, you take revenues and you subtract costs and you get profit before tax. And people go, oh, now I get that. But if you showed me the whole thing all at once, it might be overwhelming and lead to cognitive yeah. flow. So yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that would lead to cognitive overload. So just one uh, uh, more question around the when you create the actual work example for the learner, do you verify that with your subject matter experts, or do you feel confident enough because you have all that in depth? Well, so the uh, so the answer is it depends. So usually when I'm working in development. I like to continue to work with master performers in developing the content so so that it's authentic so that you know I don't have to go try do my best guess and then go back and find out that it's not quite right but that's not always possible but that's ideal so I would work with them to produce the example and say look we want a simple version then a more complex one and then one that's really complex three levels of it if you say and they can help us put something together that will make sense to the learner and it's authentic to what the learner is going to experience back on the job so yeah i work with them to create this but sometimes i've had to create it myself and take my best guess at it and then do review processes and clean it up before we do a full-blown pilot test for example well i definitely agree that it's i it, you know it's always best to create it with your master performers because they 
first of all, they're better at it. Like, you know, they know what it lo- what it should look like. But I think in your uh, approach, what's what I what I really think is really strong about it is that you almost through your analysis approach, you're almost prepping your master performance as well to then because then they start to see, oh, this is what people need to learn, right? Yeah. Because yeah. This I is the job. That- These are the authentic outputs, no kidding that you produce and these are the tasks you got to perform and this is the barriers you're going to have to deal with and avoid or just deal with and so the my approach to analysis is by design intended to really lead segue right in through design and development of that content because it's rooted in authentic performance in the first place you know what's that output that you produce how do you go about producing it and then what do you got to know? We didn't really talk about that. But what are the knowledge and skills that you need in order to be able to perform the task to produce that output? And then that all goes into design. And you got to think about the prior knowledge of the target audience and whether they're all homogeneous or they all you know, are, are new engineers or whatever. Or if you've got a mixed audience, some with experience, some with none. And then you've got to decide how you modularize that content. But when it's all said and done, you're trying to teach them to produce outputs that's perform- a performance-oriented training or learning or instruction. And so if you're focused on that performance here, it's, a, it's just a question then of how do you get that to the learner? How do you ease them into what could be a complex situation? Because you can't confront them that with that complexity. You need to give them something fairly simple to start with, let them right. get their minds wrapped around that, and confident about performing at that level then you can begin to add layers of complexity and other issues that are real world authentic to what they're going to face so that you can prepare them for dealing with, you know, some level of complexity. They may not be experts at everything unless the job is of course, be an an operator of a nuclear power facility. Then they might need to know everything before they go and take the job and sit in that seat. Um, But, but most of the time we can ease them into some level, there'll be some learning on the job that happens or additional instruction that happens afterwards to continue to build up their confidence and their capabilities to handle more complex situations. Right, so your analysis um, phase helps to give all that you know, rich insight into the, com- the layers of complexity and how to break that down and that's why you can start like for the, you know, for the novice learner at the very beginning to provide them with that worked example for one specific output, um, collaborating with your subject matter expert or master performer, as you call them, uh, to create that worked example so that the learner has sufficient guidance to, to get started. Yes. Thank you so much, Guy. This was brilliant. I'm happy to uh, be part of this. Thank you. Thank you.